Hello there. In the following video, I would like to talk about shields, specifically those that were used by Iroquoian peoples pre-contact. Once again, I've got very little in the way of resources to call upon here. The best of these resources is Champlain's illustrations of Algonquin dress. The illustration of Champlain's battle with the Iroquois also shows a single shield. In terms of written descriptions, I was able to find this one by Joseph Francois Lafitau, which reads as follows. Their shields were of willow and bark, covered with one or many skins. Some of them are of very thick skin. They were of all shapes and sizes. Let's take a closer look at these illustrations and see what sort of information we can gain from them. Let's start by looking at the shield on the left. It appears to be constructed of five wooden boards that are laced together through slits cut in the wood. Two arm straps have then been attached at a diagonal. The shield on the right offers fewer hints. Only two details are discernible, those being a pair of horizontal bars on the back of the shield. Now I've got two ideas as to what these bars could be. My first idea is that they could be reinforcements for some sort of wooden core. I consider this unlikely though, considering the spacing. If they were reinforcements, we would expect the upper bar to be closer to the top. As things stand, it's almost in the center of the shield. I think it's likely that these two bars represent sort of a riser for a grip. I imagine the center of the two risers being connected by a wooden handle. The shield on the left doesn't seem to match the descriptions in any way. If it were made of bark, I would expect it to be a full sheet rather than in little boards as we see in the illustration. The shield on the right could very well match the description. However, it also might be something else entirely. The illustration is too vague to know for certain. I'm going to start by trying to make a reproduction of the shield shown on the left. Though it doesn't match the descriptions, it could be that the early writers just didn't catalog every variety. So I did a number of experiments and tests until I found a design that worked and matched the illustration. I used pine for the boards because it was what I had to hand. I tried to match the back of the shield as closely as I could, but I did as little as I could to the front. It's likely that the shield in the illustration had the front covered with rawhide. The rawhide would have had the double effect of stiffening the shield while at the same time preventing it from splitting. In order to make this shield arrow-proof, I had to leave the boards quite thick. If I had covered it with rawhide, I would have been able to make the shield lighter without compromising the strength. The reason I didn't use rawhide here is, firstly, I wanted to see if it would work without it. Secondly, the rawhide is quite pricey, and I got other projects that I'd rather spend it on. Whatever, this works. It's just a little heavier than it should be. So let's see how it actually is to use. As you can see, it covers my torso quite well. The rounded top protects my face while still allowing me to see around the shield and strike around the shield. The shield is a little bit awkward to use dynamically. It's only held together by the cords, so there's a little bit of play between each board. This means that it flops around a bit when I move it. Part of the awkwardness is because I don't know how to use strapped shields. They're very different from what I have experience with. Every move and stance feels just a little bit off. Now I'm going to try holding both the straps together. This immediately feels much nicer to me. I'm able to use it much more naturally with my weapon. It's also relatively easy to react to blows coming in from any angle. It's still a little bit awkward due to the weight and the flexibility, but not too bad. It would be a lot better if it were covered with rawhide. Something I'm noticing is that when you hold it like a center grip shield, it's a lot more difficult to cover the torso. This suggests to me that a shield might be strapped to the arm when arrows are involved, but held in the center grip when it comes to hand-to-hand. -to -hand. It should be noted that my martial arts background is in Renaissance-era rapier fencing. The only shield techniques I know are for the buckler. In fencing with a buckler, you use the shield dynamically to try and maneuver the opponent's sword out of the way. This potentially allows you to land a blow that your opponent has no chance of defending against. I have no idea if Iroquoian shields were used in this way. We didn't write all kinds of fencing treatises. I'm just doing what makes sense to me. Let's try this shield with my armor, just to see how they interact together. Before making this shield, I had thought that I'd made the wings on my armor too short. In most stances, the wings of the armor don't cover my full arm. Experimenting with this shield tells me that I actually did make the armor correctly. If the wings were much longer, they would interfere with the use of the shield. Between the wings and the shield, the lower portion of the head is quite well defended. 
This could explain why the helmet lacks things like cheek plates. As you can see here, between the shield and the wing, I can cover up almost all of my face without compromising my vision. The only portions of my body that are vulnerable from arrow fire when I hold my shield like this are my knee and my foot. Neat. The shield also goes a long ways towards plugging up all the gaps that are left in my recreation, the gap under the left arm being the most notable. Now I'm going to hold the shield in a center grip to see if it interferes with the armor or vice versa. The shield and the armor don't interfere with each other too much, though if I'd made the shield much larger they would have done. Much like not knowing how to use the shield properly, I don't have a clue how you're supposed to use a battle axe. I can't decide whether it's better to use it like a tool or better to use it like a rapier. The shield also works as a halfway decent drum. My drumming needs work though. Well, I think I'm satisfied here. This design seems to work pretty well, and it interacts with the armor very nicely. However, there are still the other shields to talk about. I'm not going to make reproductions of them due to the sheer amount of rawhide that that would involve, but we can still do some speculation. Let's go over the literary description again. Their shields were of willow and bark, covered with one or many skins. Some of them are of very thick skin. They were of all shapes and sizes. Let's examine that description in more detail. There are several different ways to parse it. Each different way provides a different interpretation. What I consider to be the three most likely interpretations I am showing on screen now. Now let's have a look at the archaeological record to see if there are any shields from other cultures that have survived that match these descriptions. The easiest part of the description to parse is where it describes shields of very thick skins. This description matches the war shields used by the peoples of the Great Plains. The way these were manufactured was by stretching a raw buffalo hide over a pit fire, continually wetting it and baking it. This process causes the hide to shrink, but also to become thicker and stiffer and harder. Eventually the buffalo hide would be a half inch thick or more, and you'd cut it into a circle and then your shield is ready. Similar to the queer bouli that was used for armors across the pond. So how likely was it that this sort of shield was used around here? All you really need to manufacture is access to really thick skins. If we look at the range of the buffalo back in the 1700s, you'll see that it's just outside of traditional Iroquoian territory. This means that buffalo hides would have been available if you were willing to go a little bit further than normal. Another animal I can think of with thick enough skins for this sort of shield is the moose. The modern day range of the moose crosses over traditional Mohawk territory. So shields made like this would definitely have been an option. Let's return to the literary description. Their shields were of willow and bark covered with one or many skins. I wasn't able to find any extant examples in a First Nations context. However, I was able to find this shield from Great Britain. This isn't terrifically useful, but it does tell us that you can make a functional shield out of willow and bark. The only thing it's missing from the description is the rawhide cover. I imagine the shield in the illustration to be constructed in a similar fashion to this, only covered in rawhide. If we're willing to ignore the willow portion of the description, we might look to the shields used by Aboriginal Australians as a reference. One variety of these is just a carved sheet of bark with a handle attached. I don't know if there are any Canadian trees that have bark that's thick enough and strong enough to make a shield out of without a covering and without reinforcements, but if you can imagine this covered in rawhide, I think it's plausible. Either way, it's an interesting resource nonetheless. The shield pictured in Champlain's battle with the Iroquois could represent an uncovered bark shield. Something else to think about. If we ignore the bark portion of the description, we end up with something that's similar to the medicine shields used by the peoples of the Great Plains. These are made by stretching a rawhide over a frame made of willow. The use of medicine shields was mostly spiritual and psychological. They're a bit too thin to stop arrows from getting through, but they would be a heck of a lot better than nothing. Again, they don't match the description, but they're so simple that I wouldn't be surprised if they were used. So that's all I can think of in terms of reference material. As previously mentioned, I think the literary description refers to a shield that's similar to the British example I showed earlier. 
at least in terms of the construction method. Maybe someday someone with a bigger budget than myself can try and make a reproduction to see how they work. There are just two more types of shield that I'd like to talk about. These we actually know a fair bit about. In Champlain's other writings, he describes the Iroquois lifting up their canoes and using them as shields to approach a fortification. Now, I don't imagine that you would go to war with this as your intention. Canoes take a lot of skill to manufacture, and if you get even a small hole in one, it's no good at all. However, I can totally see this working if you had no better alternative. Better to have an arrow go through your canoe than to have the arrow go through you. The final type of shield that I'd like to talk about is what I've heard called a mantlet. These are large, semi-portable shields that were used in sieges. They're too heavy to fight behind, but they're well suited for advancing on an enemy position or for shooting arrows from behind. These were made either from wicker or else from three or four half logs that were bound with rope in a similar fashion to the armor but in larger form. Anyway, that's all I really have to say on the subject. I hope you enjoyed, or at least learned something. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.